Yeah, so as Blair said, um, I finished my um, undergraduate degree at Dickinson in 2016, and that will be uh, what I'm talking about today, which is a general history of medicine at the Kalal Indian Industrial School. And what I'd like to do today is take us through the history of medicine at the Indian School, connect it with local history, connect it with national and international history, and do all of this in a roundabout way to try to get uh, a little bit more information about what Colwell must have been like, the Colwell Indian School must have been like for the individuals who were enrolled there. Um, before I go through all of that, of course, a big thanks to the Historical Society, not only for hosting me today, but for all of the research support that I've received uh, over the last few years. You'll notice um, at the bottom of the presentation, I have citations for where all the photos are coming from. Most all of them are located here at this institution. There's a wealth of materials, there's a wealth of knowledge here. Um, and I couldn't be able to do, I wouldn't be able to do all of this without all of that support. Um, and also funding support for uh, all of this research and for me being here now is coming both from Dickinson and from Christ Church and the Faculty of History at Oxford. Um, and the final acknowledgement, of course, is the indigenous history of the space that we're currently standing on. So before the Carlisle Indian School was established, before this town was here, these were the, the ancestral homelands of the Susquehannock people. Uh, this is a group that no longer exists in any sort of current form. It's been amalgamated into various different groups. Um, but it's important to remember that even though there were no indigenous peoples in Pennsylvania when the Carlisle Indian School was established, there is an indigenous history to this land that we should uh, recognize. So what I'm going to do today um, is first give a very brief sort of introduction of the Carlisle Indian School. Um, if any of you have been to any of Bob's talks, you've probably heard this a lot. And there are many people in the audience who could do this a lot better than I, um, but you're stuck with me, so here we go. Um, from that, we'll talk a little bit about the buildings and the technologies at the school as a way to get at some of the medical theories of the time. From there, we'll move on to the actual individuals that are implicated in healthcare, both as caretakers and um, the angle that I'm sort of more interested in, uh, the patient and the student experience. Um, and then from there, time allowing, I'll make some broader conclusions. So we can't talk about the Colorado Indian School without talking about this man here, Richard Henry Pratt. Um, Pratt was a veteran of numerous Indian wars on the American frontier, and based on those experiences in the late 1860s and 1870s, he decided to open up the Carlisle Indian School. Now, unlike most of Pratt's contemporaries, Pratt believed that education was the way to deal with what was termed the Indian problem. And this really was the fact that as uh, settlers moved westward, they were dispossessing indigenous peoples of their lands, and as a result, all of these wars were breaking out. And these are conflicts like the Red River War and uh, the wars in the West that Pratt has experience with. Most of his contemporaries believed that indigenous peoples were savages and they could not be incorporated into the general American polity. But Pratt actually believed that instead of going at war with all of these groups, if you could assimilate them, you would actually take care of the problem of land possession. And his way of doing this was through education. By taking indigenous children from their homelands, transporting them hundreds and thousands of miles away from their lands, Christianizing them, teaching them English, teaching them a trade, he believed that he could kill the Indian in him and save the man. And this was the guiding theory for the Carlisle Indian School. So the school operated from 1879 when Pratt founded it until 1918, the end of the First World War. And during that time, around about eight to 10,000 indigenous individuals were enrolled at the school. And that's a, a conservative estimation there. And importantly, these individuals are coming from all corners 
of what we now consider to be the United States of America, but in the late 19th and early 20th century, was actually the American Empire. So if you think about what the country looked like around about 1879, everything to the west of the Mississippi is open space that these indigenous groups are living on, that settlers are moving into. Railroads are just being laid across these lands. And so the students at the Indian school are originally drawn from what is now North and South Dakota, the Sioux, the Chippewa, the Cheyenne, all of these groups here, but eventually are coming from as far away as the Aleutian Islands and Alaska, all the way up and down the West Coast, across the border with Canada, down into the Gasden Purchase, and even as far away as Puerto Rico and the Philippines. Now, this is a very interesting point in terms of the politics and the identities of the individuals at the Indian School. But there's also an interesting epidemiological point to be made here, and this is the first sort of foray into the history of medicine that we're going to make tonight. All of these groups are rather isolated, not only in culture and in language and in religious practices and things like that, but also in terms of the diseases that are endemic to them and the diseases that would have been completely unknown to them. So, for instance, a disease like measles might be very, very common among a group that's deriving from the Dakotas, but could be completely unknown down here in Nevada, Arizona, Utah, all of this area. And when you're mixing these sorts of groups, you would expect to find major disease outbreaks. And that's exactly what happens when they st start bringing students <coughs> to Carlisle. So this here is a letter from 1881, it's from March of 1881, when Pratt is informing the Commissioner of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C., that there's been an outbreak of measles at the school. Now, this letter, quite honestly, isn't that unique in terms of the fact that this is one of a dozen outbreaks that's happened at the school by this time. These disease outbreaks were very common. What's interesting from my perspective as a historian of medicine is that Pratt is specific enough to note the individual who brought the disease to the school. Quote, the disease was brought here by the Osage children under Agent Miles, one of the girls of his party being taken with it soon after arrival. It's very clear from going through the records that Carlisle's administrators and federal officials recognized that the mixing of students necessarily meant that there were going to be disease outbreaks at the Carlisle Indian School. And by 1881, Pratt has already dealt with parties of parents removing their children from the school because of disease and because of death. So it's very clear from the early history of this institution that they need to address health outbreaks at the school. And that's where we transition into the first hospital at the Carlisle Indian School. Now, as I said, Carlisle estab uh, Pratt established his school here at Carlisle in 1879, and he established them on an abandoned cavalry base, which is now the U.S. Army War College campus. At that time, there was no hospital at the site that was developed well enough to deal with this new population of students. So in 1881, Pratt requisitions funds to build this hospital. These are the uh, initial sketches of the building that is created. And this here on the left-hand side is the structure that is actually built. Now, there are a number of interesting points about this building uh, that I'd like to go through because, quite honestly, from the outside, it doesn't really look like it can tell us much, but actually it tells us a lot. So, in the late 19th century, we're dealing with a period when many of the medical theories that we take for granted today are just beginning to emerge, and one of the biggest ones is germ theory. While germ theory is in the medical discourse and is just beginning to be discussed, it does not have power enough to inform the building of a hospital. Rather, the ascendant theory of the day is miasma theory, the belief that putrid and rotting air 
that was stagnant would cause disease. And you can think about this in terms of some of the names for the diseases of the day, malaria being a good example, mal, area, bad, air. The Colwell Indian School Hospital that is built in 1882 is based on plans from the US Army Surgeon General that was designed for military camps in tropical areas where it was believed that these miasmatic diseases were very common. And what that means is that there are certain design elements that are purposefully there to combat miasma. You see that porches follow the building around both levels and that you have very high windows, not only on the levels where there would have been rooms, but also surrounding the top of the complex. This is partly because of the fact that it was believed that fresh air and ventilation would not only prevent the spread of disease, but could actually help the disease get better. These windows would have been open for the large majority of the tolerable season here in Carlisle, and these patios would have been used to exercise patients that were well enough to get them out of doors and breathing in all of that fresh air. When we move inside the building, we find another, another set of really interesting design elements that tell us a lot about the practice of medicine. For example, we see here on the left the dispensary and the office for the hospital are located on the ground floor, and they really are the main entrance to this facility as far as we can tell. Now, these locations would have been where most outpatient procedures were done at the Indian school, so if a child needed a bandage, if they needed a quick medication, they would have, that would have happened in these buildings or in these um, rooms here. If we move to the right-hand side of the structure, you see a separate kitchen and dining facility. Now, just like miasma theory informed the way that diseases might be treated through ventilation, we also have to remember that in the late 19th century, most medical care was not curative. It was palliative because cures for most diseases had not yet been established. One of the best ways to deal with all of these diseases that the Indian students are facing is through a nutrient-rich diet that would have been prepared in this kitchen that other Indian school students would not have had access to. So all of these elements tell us something about medical care and how it was distinct here. And finally in the center, we have these wards here. These are four female wards that are all uh, sectioned off. And when we move upstairs, we'll note three larger boys' wards, which is un not surprising considering the fact that the school involved more boys and girls, generally. The ward design is interesting, partly because ward designs are really not common in hospitals anymore. This is partly because of germ theory. We know that if you seat someone with cholera next to someone that doesn't have cholera, those diseases might travel. Um, when the hospital was constructed, it was purposefully constructed not only so that students would be housed together, but also so that you would have a ward for isolation. Um, and from what I can gather, the wards on either uh, long wall of the hospital would have been used for isolation. So we know that they were aware of contagion and that they would have isolated individuals during times of epidemics. Um, and the last point that I'll make uh, before moving away from the architecture of this building here are these series of rooms here. These are employee rooms. They are bedrooms and offices. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the caretaker's element, but suffice it to say that these rooms are very important for the practice of medicine because you always have to have someone in the hospital that is not only taking care of the students, but also watching them, surveying them, making sure that nothing uh, inappropriate is going on that might break the hospital's rules, and we'll talk about that again later. So I mentioned that this hospital was constructed in 1881, and that the number of disease outbreaks at the Colwell Indian School inspired its construction. One of the other things that inspired the construction of the hospital at the Indian School was the fact that there was no comparable institution in the town of Carlisle. The first building that we might be considered 
uh, that might be considered a full-time medical facility is the Lydia Baird home. This is just down High Street, the building is still there, um, although it doesn't have this sort of frontage anymore. Now, this building was constructed well before the Lydia Baird home was established, but the institution of the Lydia Baird home was founded in 1887, but it was designed for the care of widows and invalids in the town. It was not a general hospital, as we might think of today. The first institution like that is not established until 1896, when the Todd Hospital is constructed. So for a period of 15 years, there was a federally funded hospital at the Carlisle Indian School for the health care of its students. And there is not a comparable institution for the health care of largely white individuals living in the town of Carlisle who can afford to go to an institution like the Todd Hospital. As I'll talk about in just a minute, hospitals are a really interesting development in the practice of medicine in the late 19th century. We're talking about a period when doctor's visits are more common than they would be in any other period. And so the construction of a hospital actually says something about individuals' beliefs in the future of medicine. The fact of the matter is that disease was a major player in the success or failure of the Carlisle Indian School throughout its life, but especially in its early years. The federal government recognized this and it funded a hospital at the school when a hospital was not available for probably about 50 miles. And we have to think about the implications of that in terms of the administrative history of the school and the values that come in when we're talking about hospitals. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Take a quick swig of water here. <clears throat> so I said that the first hospital was constructed in 1882, and at that time, the Colorado Indian School was involving around about 250 individuals. By the turn of the century, that number is reaching more like 800. And by 1907, when construction for this facility begins, enrollment is at 1,000. Now, this is the second hospital to be built at the Carlisle Indian School. It actually is very similar in its core concepts to the first hospital in terms of having these large windows for ventilation. You have wards on either side of the complex. But this building also has some very exciting inclusions that the first hospital did not. Um, and that's actually a really good way to think about the technologies of medicine at Colorado. So those of you that may have experience in medical care may have noted that in the first hospital, there was no operating room. And we actually know from medical records that operations at the first Colorado Indian School Hospital happened in the wards, which is very common in the late 19th century. But coming into the 20th century, we have new medical theories on the rise, specifically uh, theories surrounding aseptic and antiseptic surgery. I should have mentioned before my presentation, I know it's history of medicine, there's nothing gory in any of these <laughs> images, so you don't have to worry about that. Sorry, I, I should have made that disclaimer. Um, this is actually a posed shot, um, uh, and uh, the doctor here is trying to give ether um, to sedate the patient, which is a whole other technology I won't even talk about. But this is a really good shot of the operating room at the Second Carlisle Indian School Hospital. And this facility was designed for antiseptic surgery and aseptic surgery, meaning that you had these sterilizers in place to make sure that your equipment was clean, and you had a design in the room that made sure that there was no dust getting in, that it had a separate ventilation system and all of that. Now, all of this points to a design influenced by germ theory. And that's exactly what we find, that when they're designing this structure, they have germ theory in mind, and they don't want to be doing all of these surgeries where other students are around. We also know that this operating room is designed not just for the general procedures that any hospital might come across, but has specific equipment in it 
for the procedures that were very common amongst the Indian school students. Um, two good examples of this, the first being um, appendicitis, which is very common among youth and for some reason in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, is much more common than it is today. Um, and there are a few debates as to why that is, but uh, we know that appendicitis is a very common condition among Indian school students. Oftentimes, these individuals would have been removed to the Todd Hospital in town when the Todd Hospital was constructed. By 1908, they can do it in-house. We also know that in this operating room, they have the ability to treat for trachoma. Now, I'll talk about trachoma a little bit more in the second half of my presentation, but for those of you that aren't aware, trachoma is a viral infection of the eyes that causes very sharp, hard granules to form underneath the eyelids, and it causes blindness because it's uh, scratching up uh, everything underneath the eyelid, uh, which is very soft. Um, it's very, very easily treated today, but in the, uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century, it was only treatable through surgical intervention, and so that is a capability of the hospital here. So we know that this operating room is designed with medical technologies specifically for the Indian school. We also know that that hospital had a laboratory. Again, we're talking about a period where some of the medical theories that we take for granted today are just emerging. If someone in this room were to contract something like tuberculosis, for example, your diagnosis would be determined based on a laboratory test to find the germ in your spit or find the germ in a DNA sample of some kind or a, a fluid sample of some kind. This sort of medicine where diagnostics is taking part in the laboratory is just emerging in the 20th century. And so finding a laboratory at the Carlisle Indian School <coughs> Hospital is very interesting because of the expense of these facilities. Um, this is a student file, and I'll note uh, also that all the student files have their names redacted. Um, uh, and we notice here that the individual has been diagnosed with tuberculosis, and their treatment is being monitored through blood counts, and specifically through their leukocyte counts. So they're trying to track the uh, spread of the condition through their blood counts to see if they're improving or getting worse. We also know that the Carlisle Indian School had an x-ray suite. Now, to us, this seems rather benign, but actually, in the early 20th century, x-rays are a very, very interesting technology. So, Rottengen rays or x-radiation rays are only discovered in the second, or oh, I'm sorry, in the last decade of the 19th century. They're only coming into the scientific world and the medical world at the turn of the century. And it's a really exciting technology. It's the first time in human history that you can see inside a living body without cutting it open. And so x-rays are actually very interesting from a scientific perspective, but they don't tend to enter into medical care until the 1910s and 1920s, and in fact, some hospitals in urban areas don't start getting x-ray machines until the 20s and 30s. And yet we know that at the Carlisle Indian School, there was an x-ray machine as early as 1905. Now, there are a number of reasons that might explain this, especially because this is a very expensive technology. We need to try to figure out why it's here. One of the theories that uh, I like to argue is that X-rays are very sleek and sexy science in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries, and that's exactly what they're being used for here. Most of the time, the X-rays that we're finding from the Carlisle Indian School are fractures that are received by its sports players. In the 20th century, as I'm sure you know if you've gone to any major talk about the Carlisle Indian School, Carlisle is defined by its sports teams, its football team, its baseball team, all of its track and field athletes. And all of those individuals are being followed by national newspapers. When those individuals are injured, the national newspapers want to make sure that their favorite athletes are getting back on the field as soon as possible. And that's what we find 
medical care doing. We find mentions in newspapers of how wonderful the school's hospital is because it has an x-ray machine, because it has a doctor that can make sure that these broken bones are set properly and that these athletes can return to the field quickly. This is one example of many that I'll talk about where medical care actually is used on a public side to increase the reputation of the Colorado Indian School where it's not just being used for the treatment of students, but also for the aggrandizement of the school's reputation. The last technology I want to talk about real quick um, are these very um, interesting looking posed photographs of a uh, tuberculosis sleeping patio. Now I mentioned that germ theory is on the rise in this period, and the tuberculosis germ has been discovered by the time that this hospital was constructed. However, penicillin and antibiotics that would treat tuberculosis are not discovered until a generation after the schools closed. So you're sort of in this period of limbo where you can identify tuberculosis definitely, but you can't treat it with any, or with any sort of drug or any therapy other than what you were using before. So these tuberculosis sleeping patios had screen windows so that you could get fresh air at night, and they were a good isolation space for your tuberculosis students. Otherwise, treatment for tuberculosis really hasn't changed, and so the inclusion of these patios is a really interesting uh, fact about the history of the Carlisle Indian School. And the reason is because tuberculosis in this period is endemic among indigenous populations. These images and images like them are used in publications about the Colorado Indian School that are shared on reservations. Now, the reason that one might share these images, I think, is a good support for the uh, argument I just posed earlier, that actual medicine here is being used to argue that the school is doing well for its students, that it's providing these medical facilities. I would be remiss, of course, to focus on the hospital without talking about the other side of disease and medicine, which is the prevention of disease. And what we find here is shocking. Throughout the history of the Colorado Indian School, Thousands of thousands of dollars and hundreds of man hours are spent to make sure that the hospital has some of the cutting edge technologies in medical science. And yet, we know that buildings like these boys' quarters here were chronically overcrowded. We know that the food at the Colorado Indian School was often of poor nutritional value. And we know that at least up until 1911, the bathrooms did not have running water, and they were working off of wash, wash basins. Combine this with the fact that students are sharing linens and towels, musical instruments, and eating utensils, and we can understand why conditions like tuberculosis are so common at the Colorado Indian School. It's very easy to spread these contagious diseases if you're not doing anything to prevent them. X-ray facilities sleeping patios and things like that cost the federal government thousands upon thousands of dollars. And yet living facilities are chronically overlooked. This again, I think, is explained best by thinking about the way that these sorts of improvements could have been sold to the public. It's not really that interesting to tell a national reporter that you have running water in your bathrooms. It's much more interesting to tell them that you have a technology that the Pennsylvania hospital just got a few years ago. I'll leave that hanging in the end. That's one of my uh, larger arguments from my undergraduate thesis. Of course, when focusing solely on architecture and technology, it can be easy to forget the people that are implicated within healthcare. Now, this is a big concern from both of my sort of main ball games, if you will, the history of medicine and Native American studies. In the history of medicine, especially over the last 
20 years or so, there's been an increasing focus on trying to capture the experience of the patient, what we might call the history from below. The same trend exists in Native American studies, where especially when you're talking about boarding schools, the perspective of the students is really what historians are trying to go for. Unfortunately, the archives that survive from the Colorado Indian School are not designed to tell us much about the perspectives of its students, because these are administrative records that are kept to record an institutional history. However, through some interesting uh, unconventional readings of conventional sources, reading between the lines, if you will, I would argue that we can actually gain a sense of some of these personal experiences. And in trying to briefly do so today, I want to talk about four main groups, all of which we can identify in this wonderful picture here. And I'll say, just as a really quick tangent off of my uh, little script, this is my favorite image from the Colorado Indian School. Um, and you'll see why in a second, but this is something that I discovered at the Historical Society here about two years ago, and I use in every presentation. Um, so the first group uh, of stakeholders we're going to talk about are the doctors. This wonderfully bearded man that looks kind of like a Russian nightmare um, is Dr. Obadiah Given. Um, he's one of the 16 doctors that practices at the Carlisle Indian School over its 40-year history. The seated figure next to him is the head nurse, Miss Ball. Uh, Nurses, professional nurses, play a really important, if hidden, part in medicine at the Carlisle Indian School. Um, and so I'd like to think about them for a little bit. And then we'll move on to our last two big groups. The first being the pupil nurses who are standing and sitting around. Um, pupil nurses were Carlisle Indian School students, all female, who uh, were charged with the routine medical care at the hospital, and so their experiences are very interesting um, and one that I'd like to get at. And the last group, of course, are the patients. And the patient in this picture is in the window up there. This is why I love this photo. It's actually the only photo that I've been able to find where I have all four groups together. Okay. <laughs> so I mentioned that the first group that I'm going to be talking about are the doctors. Now there are 16 doctors that practice at the Carlisle Indian School over its 40 year history that I've been able to identify. Some of them are resident physicians that are at the Indian School living there 24-7. Some of them are local doctors that are contracted by the federal government to treat patients at the Carlisle Indian School. Um, and there are some familiar names uh, that come up on that list that are also resident physicians at the Todd Hospital. Um, despite the fact that there are at least 16 of them, we know that they're very similar in a lot of ways. The first thing is that all of them are men. Medical care in the late 19th and early 20th century was a very gendered field, and it's only at the turn of the 19th century that women start to be uh, accepted into medical schools and enter into medical practice in the United States. There are at least two instances I found of female physicians applying for jobs at the Colorado Indian School Hospital, and as far as I know, neither of them ever received that position. So the doctors are all men, and importantly, they're all trained at medical schools here in the United States. Now, that might not actually be that surprising when you first hear it, but it actually has some really important implications for the role of medicine in Carlisle's mission of assimilation. The hospital at the Carlisle Indian School is treating indigenous children, indigenous youth, all the way up really until their late 20s, early 30s, depending on how old some of them are. And yet indigenous medical practices, indigenous healing practices, are never allowed to be practiced at the Carlisle Indian School. And students are punished when they're found to be either practicing their own uh, healing practices, or in some cases when their parents might send them indigenous materia medica to use, uh, or uh, if they try to self-treat 
using things that they might have forged uh, in the environment. All of these men are treating Carlisle Indian School students using scientific medicine that is dominant in the Western world. And they're punishing students who are using indigenous healing practices. So we have to recognize that the practice of medicine is not objective, and that it actually is implicated in the assimilationist policies of the school. The final point I make is actually related in that all but one of the doctors that practice at the Carlisle Indian School are Caucasian. The only doctor that isn't is Dr. Carlos Montezuma. Now, Dr. Zuma is Apache. He is, an, he is orphaned at a very young age due to many of these same wolves we were talking about at the very beginning. He is adopted by a white military family and put through the University of Chicago's medical schools. He then comes to the Carlisle Indian School. He practices in Carlisle for 18 months and he becomes the uh, a leading member of the Cumberland County Medical Society here in Carlisle. And then he moves on, establishes a private practice, and later in life becomes one of the leading figures in the Native American civil rights movement, if you'll think of it that way, and he's one of the main figures that advocates for Native American citizenship, which is granted in 1924. Now, Dr. Montezuma's biographers note that while he really is very proud of his heritage and is an advocate in the Native American rights movements in the uh, early 20th century, his medical care and his medical practices are all Western and they're all, bi they are all biomedical. When Dr. Montezuma is hired by the Colorado Indian School, the school newspapers celebrate him as an example of the power of education in assimilating uh, indigenous groups. And so Dr. Montezuma actually represents another element of the assimilationist mission of schools like Carlisle. And as a medical figure, we see again how Western biomedicine is used as an example of the benefits of civilization as the language of the day was, uh, as again reflected through medicine. The second group that I want to talk about uh, briefly are the professional nurses that serve the Carlisle Indian School. As I mentioned, uh, medicine was a very gendered field in uh, the late 19th and early 20th century, and quite honestly it still is, but especially in this period, nurses were all women, Nurses in the United States were almost all white. Nurses in the United States were almost all either unmarried or widowed. And they were all uh, at least expected to meet standards of high moral fortitude and high moral standing. So you can think of figures like Florence Nightingale in the same vein, the idea of these women serving as good Christian saving angels. Uh, this really is the rhetoric that underpins professional nursing in this period. There are only six women uh, that serve as the nurse at the Carlisle Indian School Hospital over its 40-year period. So actually, the nurses are a more stable and consistent medical caretaker than the doctors at the school. And this is really important when we think about what the operations of this hospital must have looked like. While well, the doctors are dealing with surgeries, they're dealing with uh, finalizing diagnoses and all of these sorts of things, the nurses are the ones that are in charge of routine bedside care. They are the ones that are operating the dispensary for outpatients. Uh, and they are the ones who are living upstairs in the hospital, surveying students making sure that they're not breaking any of the hospital rules about sneaking into the wards for the other gender, or taking medicines that you shouldn't, making sure you're taking the medicines that you do. So the nurses are implicated in healthcare at Carlisle in a very similar way to the doctors, not only in ensuring that indigenous healing practices are being ignored, 
and uh, omitted, but also in making sure that students are properly uh, behaving and properly uh, participating in biomedicine. The last role of the professional nurses is to train the pupil nurses. And this is where I'll start to talk a little bit more um, in depth about uh, the nurses um, and, and their experience. So the pupil nurses training program was the pinnacle achievement for a female Colwell Indian School student. In order to be invited to uh, take part in the program, you had to be one of the older students, you had to have one of the highest grades in your class, and you had to be seen as a very moral and very uh, Christian character. So already, we're seeing some of the same hallmarks that are inspiring professional nursing uh, mirrored onto the pupil nurses program. Now these pupil nurses would have been in training from anywhere from one to three years on a curriculum that was designed to mirror training programs at teaching hospitals in America's cities. They would have been trained not only in routine bedside care, but also in working in dispensaries and doing first aid, and in surgery support. And the ultimate goal of the nurses training program was so that they would eventually make their way into professional teaching hospitals where they could be trained to be nurses in scientific hospitals. So institutions like the German Hospital of Brooklyn, New York, um, and other hospitals in cities like New York, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., and most commonly, Philadelphia. So the Pupil Nurses Training Program is obviously a professional course. It's designed, much like the industrial courses at the Carlisle Indian School, to give these students a trade that they can pursue. But interestingly enough, the trajectory of the Carlisle Indian School Pupil Nurses Program is to ensure that these very high achieving women can only get jobs in urban areas. There's no need for a nurse that can run laboratory equipment in a hospital on a reservation. So by training these pupil nurses in programs that are going to then place them in America's cities, they will end up staying in cities and ultimately following the trajectory that the Kalau Indian School painted, which was to take indigenous youth and keep them from their indigenous communities even after they went to the school. And we actually see this happening quite frequently, even when uh, the pupil nurses decide not to continue nursing, such as Rose Vanami here, who actually marries a Kalau football star um, in a very sort of stereotypical and cliched way as described in her student file, we know that the robots actually end up settling in urban areas because of the training that she received. At least that's as far as I've been able to, train, to trace uh, uh, Rose and her family. So we know pupil nursing was implicated in the policies of the Carlisle Indian School and the Ultimate Aims, we can also think about this relatively simply in terms of biomedicine as well, just like the professional nurses and just like the doctors at the Carlisle Indian School, they're only allowed to practice Western biomedicine. So the pupil nurses are again uh, being trained in a form of healing that was counter to what they would have uh, been trained in if they were to become healers in their indigenous communities. And we know that the pupil nurses training program had a very emotive element to it. Now, it's not necessarily something that we might think about until you actually pause. But these are young women, around about ages 16 to 20, who are being trained in nursing in a hospital that is caring for their sick and dying classmates. This is something that is considered to be unethical in modern biomedicine. Uh, 
It's something that you're not allowed to do if you're in medical residencies. You're not allowed to treat people you know. And yet that's exactly what the pupil nurses are being asked to do. And so one has to actually think about what it must have been like to be in the shoes of a pupil nurse, to be treating your fellow classmates. And these are all elements of the pupil nurses program that are deliberately designed. The pupil nurses are not allowed to be placed in the Todd Hospital in town, despite the fact that many of the same physicians that they're training under are residents of the Todd Hospital as well. So there's an intentional element there. The last group I want to talk about, um, and I will sort of talk about in stages, are the uh, students who were patients at the Carlisle Indian School and the students generally to try to get at what it must have been like from their perspective to experience medicine and experience disease. Now again, this is really hard to capture because it's not part of the operable record to capture pupil experiences and pupil perspectives. But if we again look at sources from a sort of sideways perspective, we can actually piece together some of these things. So one good example of this, and again, you'll see the redacting, um, a good example of this are the physical records or the inspection records that we have for most every student that went to the Carlisle Indian School. It was school policy very early on that any student who wanted to be enrolled had to go through a physical medical inspection, similar to a physical that uh, children get today if they're going to be enrolled in schools. Now, this might not seem that important or interesting, but we have to remember that these are medical records that are kept at the hospital for every student, and they're routinely updated. The purpose of these records is to create a medical baseline for your students. Not only so that you can make sure that you're not enrolling individuals who are sick, but also that you can make sure that all of your students are, are supposedly within what are considered to be healthy weights, that you know their medical history, so you know if they're at risk of carrying certain diseases. Uh, female students' menstruation is regularly monitored. We know that students are frequently inspected for various diseases of different types. All of this is part of a system of health surveillance. In a Foucauldian sense, you might think of this as a form of bodily control, where they're making sure that they know what's going on with their students' bodies. But on a more sort of general human sense, we know that as a result of these inspections, every single individual who enters the gates of the Carlisle Indian School to be a student is involved in the medical infrastructure. So we know that medicine and healthcare is touching everyone at the school. And that's something that oftentimes we don't necessarily think about, but medicine has a wide-reaching impact if only for that moment uh, in their call out experience. If we move to administrative files, we can actually start to piece together what the epidemiology of the school looks like. We know from student files, we know from school newspapers and things like that, that illness was so frequent at the Carlisle Indian School that it was more noteworthy when the hospital had very few patients than when it was overcrowded. And we can use files like this to map out some of the diseases that students would have been suffering from. And this list is actually rather interesting from a number of perspectives. We note, for example, that there are some diseases on this list uh, that we would associate with uh, conditions of childhood, things like caries, for example, which are uh, cavities in the teeth, um, uh, skin diseases, which could be anything as uh, benign as eczema, um, and things like remittent fever, uh, diarrhea, things like that, which we can then move not only into childhood diseases, but also diseases of malnutrition and overcrowding. And then moving down into um, the diseases that I'd like to talk about um, 
in more detail tuberculosis and trachoma, uh, which he was identified as conjunctivitis. So trachoma, uh, which I've mentioned, and tuberculosis, which I mentioned, were endemic at the Callout Indian School. Now I say that, but that doesn't necessarily give us an idea of what that means. In 1912, there were 190 students that had identifiable trachoma. In 1912, there were about 900 students involved. In 1909, there were 87 pupils who supposedly have glandular trachoma that is severe enough and advanced enough that it requires treatment. And in 1909, you're dealing with a population, again, around about 900. So 10, 20% is what we're reflecting in these rates. We know that in 1915, trachoma is reported at 75%. So when I say endemic, I mean that these conditions would have been something not just that you may have seen in passing, but that as a student, if you did not have yourself, a large number of your classmates, a large number of your friends would have likely had. We know that Colwell Indian School students recognize that some of their fellow classmates were sick. We know this from memoirs like Luther Standing Bear's memoir, My People, the Sioux, where he talks about his classmates getting sick. And we also know that students are well aware of the fact that many of their classmates are dying from these conditions. Tuberculosis and trachoma are two of the major diseases at the Kalal Indian School. This list goes on and on. The point isn't necessarily the specific conditions here. The point, rather, is that disease was more prevalent at the Kalal Indian School than we sometimes think. And in terms of student experience, that means that disease was an absolutely implicit part of the Carlisle Indian School experience, something that students wouldn't have been able to escape and wouldn't have been able to ignore. Um, oh, and one last point um, on the uh, student deaths. We know that in student obituaries, when a student passed away, their uh, death was often used to moralize health rules. So, an individual has passed away, if you wear your coats, you can escape the same fate. If you submit to medical care and you don't resist like this student did, then we can save you, things like that. So again, medicine being implicitly linked to uh, the acceptance of the teachings at the school. So if we come back to this picture, we can piece together a number of other broad strokes things. And I really am talking in broad strokes here because the student experience is um, something that quite honestly, you can't do justice in a short speech like this. It's something that you have to really delve into, but I'm trying to give a very sort of general overview. But when we think about the student experience just represented in this picture here, we again see the treatment of wards. So we know from student files, and we know just generally based on architecture, that students would have been cohabited, and there was a sense of camaraderie among students. We know that certain charitable individuals donated board games and books that were read in the wards, so there's a sense of camaraderie there. But we also know that this same system allowed for surveillance by the professional nurses and by the pupil nursing staff to make sure that the students were still following all the rules at the Indian school. We know again that treatment is being undertaken without consideration of indigenous healing practices. And again, we know that students are punished for using medicines that were not prescribed to them or by forging their own or having them sent from parents. And Again, we know that they're being treated by fellow classmates. And you add all of this to the fact that the individuals that are being treated in the wards are severely sick, 
and they're sick enough to be removed from their classrooms, which is the primary purpose of them being at the school. They're sick enough to be removed from their classrooms. They're at a hospital that not only is treating them in a medical system that is completely distinct from their own experiences, but also in general, it's a big scary hospital and we know that uh, children are quite often very afraid when they're sick and in hospitals. And all of this comes together to equal a very intimidating experience for sick children and generally for the school's population of disease and of medicine. So when I talk about medicine having a really uh, large impact on the entirety of the school's population, this is what I mean. So, <clears throat> the last few seconds of conclusion, um, I hope that I've uh, shown how healthcare was, no matter how you judge it, a significant aspect of the Carlisle Indian School experience. As we might expect, medical care was essential to the school's plan of defending its students' health. And we know that scholars debate back and forth about how effective that treatment was. And that's a debate that I'm involved in uh, as well in my research. But that debate actually doesn't matter for the purposes of this presentation because we know that no matter what, health was something that was informing everyone's experience of the Carlisle Indian School. We also know that healthcare was directly tied to assimilation and directly tied to the institution's uh, reputation uh, and public face. So this page here, for example, is coming from a tourist pamphlet. It's celebrating the wonderful medical care that is being provided at the school. Again, we can debate back and forth about whether or not that medical care was good at what times, but samples like this show us that medical care is not solely meant to take care of students. It's also meant to take care of the school's reputation, and it's meant to, in a larger sense, take medicine and make it part of the assimilationist goals of the school through biomedical training for pupil nurses and through medical surveillance of the school's population. And finally, we can think about medicine and disease in terms of the legacy of the Carlisle Indian School. And this is the work uh, that I'm doing now that Blair sort of mentioned in a very sort of scary way. Um, in terms of studying the history of mortality at the Carlisle Indian School and the impact of debates about health, debates about disease, and debates about death on how the Carlisle Indian School was understood in the present day, or is understood in the present day, and was understood in its own day. We have to remember that medicine was a concern of the Carlisle Indian School, its founder and its administrators, from the very beginning. It's something that we can't ignore when we're talking about the legacy of the school because it's something that shaped how the school operated, how the school functioned, and the experiences of the students that went there. And while I haven't been able to get into great depth on any of those topics, um, I hope that this has given you a taster of many. Thank you so much.